<laughs> okay. So we finished the other day, right? Embarrassing Christina by having her try to lift weights that she couldn't lift at the bottom. How's your arm today, by the way? Um, I mean, I had PT yesterday for my shoulder, so I mean, my whole freaking right side hurts. <laughs> okay. Well, like I am sore. My right arm, my undergrads are laughing. Um, we talked about muscle damage today. It's yeah. part of my reason for you were in there. It's part of my reason for doing this. But like I'm sore from this day. So we were showing, we finished up talking about the sarcomere link tension relationship, whereby the extent to which there is overlap between actin and myosin or sarcomeres is going to determine how much force we get because that determines how much cross -breed. And if you could stretch a sarcomere way out, there's not any overlap, you can't form cross bridges, you can't get very much force. If you can shrink them way, way down, then they can't go anywhere. Plus, you're getting some the actin filaments begin to overlap each other. So you're kind of pulling against, you're pulling against each other. So we lose some force that way. Okay. In most human intact whole person in vivo contractions, okay. We are going to see something that looks like the sarcomere link tension relationship, but it's not the sarcomere link tension relationship. Okay. What you see here, these are some really, really cool data. Um, it came from a guy, his name is Rick Lieber. He's an MD, PhD. Um, he's at the University of San Diego. And these data were taken from people while they were having. Um, hand surgery done. And so they he works with the surgeon and they go in and while they've got them opened up to do the hand surgery, they actually string up like the muscle of the tendon and things and they shorten them and they measure things and they lengthen them and they measure. And so they're actually getting things and then they they do at the same time they sort of take little pieces out and they can they can image down on the sarcomeres. And so just really, really cool stuff to think. Um, so what you can see here is sarcomere link in micrometers, okay? This is, well, this is the <coughs> joint angle. So this was, I guess, I apologize. They do it during hand surgery, but they also do it sometimes during knee surgery. This is knee joint angle, okay? I feel like a dumbass now. But sarcomere link, okay? And then relative force is a percentage of things that you're trying to graph out there. Relative force is going up. We've got... The effective lever arm of the knee. So this is the distance basically from right the insertion of the patella tendon to the axis of rotation of the knee, if you will know. And then this is actual torque that we're measuring on from an output standpoint at various knee joint angles. Okay. And so what you can see is we get a little bit of a change here in sarcomere. Okay, so when I told you guys that the sarcomere link tension relationship doesn't really have a big effect, I didn't mean that it has no effect, but you really have, it's hard to stretch or shorten the sarcomere so much that we're appreciably sort of losing or gaining a huge amount of force there. So it changes a couple of micrometers in the mental quality. Here's the effective lever on okay? Torque is force. It's the angular analog of force. So it's force multiplied by the moment arm, okay, which is in this instance is our distance from insertion to axis of rotation. So at very small knee joint angles, okay, way up here, way out near full extension, I have a relatively small lever arm. As I move down, okay, as I'm going to, right, as I Flex my hamstrings and move down this way. Knee joint angle gets bigger. And somewhere in here, I'm going to have effective lever arm is going to get bigger. And then eventually, as I go back past 90 degrees, the effective lever arm is going to go down and get smaller again. And so you can take all of these things and multiply all of this together and generate right, an actual curve where you see how torque changes in response to. The lever arm change and the change in the sarcomere leg. So you make the ball this back and forth. Okay? So. So it's going from extension to flexion? Yes. Okay. They find it in the conductor. Yeah. So that's how that is going to change. Okay? 
Okay. And so what I want to illustrate for you guys is that human movement is angular. Human movement occurs at joints. Okay. And so we talk about all of these things, like what's the kind of contraction? What's the recruitment pattern? How much muscle is engaged? What's the firing rate? What's the sarcomere length? We also have to consider what is the moment arm at a particular joint because all of these other things are going on that help us get force in the muscle, okay? In the muscle. But that muscle is attached to a tendon which pulls on a bone and that has some sort of lever arm to it. And so as that lever arm changes, as it does through a range of motion, it's also going to affect the amount of torque that we get in response to the force that's being generated. Okay? So you, the same amount of force from the muscle is being generated in theory, right, by the fibers that I can change what we measure from an output standpoint by all these different other things. So again, it's complicated. Again, it depends. There's a huge number of things, okay? And what's really going to freak you out is when I tell you that as you move through the joint angles, since you change the recruitment pattern a little bit, and you can't recruit as well in certain places as in others. So it's not, it's not always like it's the same the whole time. In the lab, we can make it that way because we're always <clears> testing <throat> sort of right in this portion of the knee joint angle, and kind of always picking a place that's pretty close to optimum lever arm, pretty close to optimum sarcomere length, right? Pretty close to maximum force production. So we're going to be able to get maximum recruit and maximum fire rate. But that's not always going to, you know, that can change around the circuit. Okay. Let's see. So again, here's some, these are, well, this is again, these are angles. Maybe they've done the hand stuff more recently. This is some data from the late 80s, right? But you're going to see basically that you've got force production here, and then R is going to be kind of the, uh, the moment arm. Yeah. And you've got torque, which is the force in the moment arm. Okay. So you can note how it is going to change. Torque comes up and torque comes back. Okay. As if that wasn't enough. Can you go back for a second? Yes, biomechanist. I'm just looking at a question. The force and the torque is just the Okay. Yeah. The force line is actually. Yeah, straight. The torque is actually that, I think. Thank you. Of course. Should have brought the weights back. Should have brought the weights back. Okay. No, no, it's okay. We don't need to do We don't need to do Okay. Additionally, when we move, okay, the velocity at which we move also affects how much force we have. So when you try to go fast during a concentric contraction, you get less force production. Okay. So if we had our dumbbells and I'm like, oh, curl, 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 curl as fast as you can, right? I'm going this fast with no weight on my arm. You could give me somebody's backpack and I probably can't go that fast. Okay. Again, same muscle, same moment arm length, same recruitment, same firing rate. But as I move, the speed also affects the output. So we call this the force velocity relationship. This relationship looks a certain way for concentric contractions and it looks different for eccentric contractions. I'll draw all of this out and we'll show you guys all of this. Okay. So here's one of the original papers that showed this. It was published in 1950, and it has velocity here on the y-axis, which is not how we commonly do it anymore. Um, and it has force here on the x-axis. And so what you can note is that down here at zero velocity, we've got our highest amounts of force. Okay. Zero velocity is an isometric contraction, right? Nothing is moving, there's no velocity. So you get, in comparison to concentric contractions, isometric contractions, because they don't have to move, should get us the highest force rate. So here's isometric, and then here is velocity. This is in meters per second. 
as velocity increases, right, as it goes up, there's going to be this sort of accelerating decline in, in force production as we go faster and faster. Okay. In more kind of modern graphs and ways of doing all of this, which is going to be what's in the next slide, we flip the two axes around. We're going to put force on this axis and velocity on this axis because we really don't want to graph the concentric and the eccentric portion. So this side looks the same, even though know, you can flip these around and it's a mirror of each other. The important thing to consider with this, okay, why does this happen? Why, when I go faster, can I not get as much force as when I go slow? Okay. Again, it all comes back to the cross bridge cycle and it all comes back to cross bridge mechanics, right? I engage a cross bridge in order to generate force. If I want to go fast, okay, there has to be repeated short release, shortening release, shortening release. I have to be able to disengage those cross bridges so that I can reattach them and continue getting that movement, that shortening movement that is happening. In order for that to happen, if you pick any instant in time, okay, any instant in time, I'm going to have fewer cross bridges engaged than I would if I was doing the same thing at a slower velocity. Right, because they have to break. Cross bridges have to break to be able to be recycled. And so to go fast, they have to break quickly. Or I have to have more of them broken so that I can get them in, in continuous shape. Okay? So during fast contractions, fewer cross bridges are engaged at any instant in time. Therefore, that's why you get less force. So that's a great question. So there is some there's some thought that the very, very, very top end of velocity can only be driven by in some ways the pressure theory. But it's hard to know because when you're going really, really fast, like you will notice this. Of eight meters per second, there's almost no force production whatsoever. And so, what that tells us is that there's practically no cross bridges being formed. And so, are you limited? Are you able to get enough neural drive to try to engage the cross bridges? But they're just, they're just in the midst of being broken to do all of this. Or is there a limitation because I can't get the cross bridges to attack because we're in the absolute fracture period and I can't get enough? Right. We can do the math on it. You, you, in theory, if you went really, really fast, maybe that becomes an issue. But the time it takes to sort of break and redo the cross bridge cycle tends to be a little bit slower than what it is to be able to repolarize a neuron. And so we tend to think that the, the limiting factor is on, is on the muscle side of things. But I mean, in a vacuum, you could try to go fast enough where that could be a problem. So, it's a good question. Okay. So, don't worry about don't worry about what this is. Okay. Do I not have? Okay, I'm gonna come back to it. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna skip around. I can't. I don't know why my slides are not exactly in the right order. Don't worry about the influence. Of all that this is going to tell us is that there's different motor control strategies for dynamic sort of concentric and eccentric contraction as opposed to isometric. And so if I ask Brady to stand up and like hold something like out like this, like hold an isometric contraction, that's a much different sort of neural strategy to hold it in space at that force production as it begins to wobble versus if we had him in the lab in our isometric dynamometer where everything is strapped down and he's just here and we say try to pull as hard as you can. Right. So the, the strategy is a little bit different. And I don't, I don't want to we can get lost trying to explain what this graph is. So don't don't worry. Okay. Ready, did you have a question? 
I'm just confused in like what were the four like the scores that were measuring because like the second law like like the mass time acceleration the faster we move something the more force there is so like if we're moving our muscles faster how is there less force you know I just feel like is there something different in a way like that's so oh, okay right so there's velocity versus so as we go okay. faster we're measuring less force coming out of the vehicle you're you're talking about how much force do we need to accelerate something to a particular, like to a particular velocity and all of those things. So I mean, I can tell you that you've got to have, you have some capacity to generate force here that you can measure primarily isometrically. So you give us the thing that tells us kind of what the maximum portion of this has to be. Right? This number. Is going to have some influence potentially on sort of you've got to be able to generate some force to sort of create the acceleration a little bit. And so people that are stronger have the potential to move the same amount of mass faster than somebody that is not as strong. So there's a relationship, but we're looking at it a little, it's, it's just a little different. Yeah. Right. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. I'm not a physicist. I, I, I'm like, wait, Newton's out. This one, this one, this one. Okay. So <clears throat> let me, I'm going to skip ahead and we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about eccentric contractions really quickly. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about more of the synchronization. I don't know why this is stuck here. Um, it's another thing. And Richard, Elise, and Christina, does this does this look like something else we've been looking at? This looks like one of our our EDA signals here, but it's not actually what that is. So, okay. So, concentric contractions, muscles shorten. Isometric contractions, muscles stay the same length. Eccentric contractions. Are okay. Eccentric contractions are super fun and super weak. They're eccentric. Old professor used to say, he'd be like, they're not eccentric, they're X. And I'm like, okay, Kevin, like your dad jokes, we don't need them. Okay. But here I am making them for um, in the next week. So, this, what, what I mean by all of this is that eccentric con contractions are neural strategy. The way we recruit and activate muscle during eccentric contractions is actually different than it is during concentric contractions. And that's important. Okay. And the sort of relationships with velocity and overall force production are different during eccentric contractions than they are during concentric contractions for some very specific reasons. One is the neural strategy. Two is the wonder of connective tissue and its elasticity. Okay, So generally, eccentric contractions can generate more force than we can get isometrically. Does not matter how fast they go. All right, I'm going to do this. So, here we have, this is a force velocity curve. This is the eccentric side here. This is the concentric side from over here. And what I want you guys to look at is this one. Don't worry about the other one because we're doing these, those are artificial contractions, but we're sort of subsuming what happens in the muscle spindles and the velvet tendons and we'll get some more crazy things. Look at this, this one right here in the dark blue circle, okay? Concentric, right, fast velocity slow velocity, more force, less force. Here's isometric right in the middle at zero. And then this is eccentric, okay? Note how I get a little bit of an increase in force early on, and then it's basically flat, right? Eccentric contractions tend to accept at very slow velocities. And if you get way out of here, it kind of takes off again, okay? And at very fast, fast velocities, they tend to be independent. Get the same force no matter how fast you go. Okay. Same force no matter how fast. The other thing that happens with them is that they use less energy than isometric, which uses less energy than concentric contractions. Here's a really cool experiment, right? Things that we don't get to do very much anymore because we know things. It's published in 1952. Um, it's from sort of Brenda Bigland Ritchie, um, who's very, very big famous to you. Okay. 
And so what you can see here is they had these two bikes and they had hooked the chain of the bike. Um, each bike was hooked together by the, by the chain. So what you pedal on, you pedal forward on one side and it pedals the bike behind it backwards, okay? Or you pedal this bike backwards and it makes this bike go forward. And so what you do is you essentially put two people on there and they ride against each other. And you have one person sort of resist a little bit and let the other person, the other person then goes forward and they're able to turn and it goes, but this person is generating just ever so slightly less work than what they are. And then you measure oxygen consumption or energy use in both of them what you see is something that looks like this. Here's concentric, cycling is a concentric kind of driven activity, right? Very concentric, concentric. Running is much more con act. You'll, you should never be sore when you go cycling. You have your quads up at this point, okay? If you go run, you haven't run in a while, and your chest exploded, you run, you do kind of build your quads up, you get sore. But here is work. This is kilogram meters per minute, which is the dumbest way possible to express work. Um, we think of this now as a watt in some ways. Um, but so you were doing this sort of positive work out this direction, so concentric work. And what you will notice, this is oxygen consumption. So this is energy expenditure. Here is work. There's this nice linear relationship. So it's like do more work, my O2 consumption goes up. This is the person going forward. Here's the person going backwards. Same exact work, right? They're going backwards, which means it's mostly eccentric in their quads. These people are concentric. And same work, look, like barely using any, any energy whatsoever. Okay? What they also would like to do in this experiment that I haven't shown is they put, they put a big, strong person here and a little bitty weaker person here. And the little bitty weaker person can do the eccentric contractions and can basically almost always stop the big, strong person. Okay, so um, I used to do that in, in class when I would teach exercise spirits. Uh, we used to try to get the track and athlete, the male athlete in class, get them to come up and have them do the floats concentrically. And we would find someone that was smaller than very often a woman and have them do the eccentric side and things they could do. The, the girls could usually do the three reps, so we just about the same way the eccentric to the basket. Up, it was pointed out to me at some point that that might be a mildly sexist thing to do. So we stopped uh, doing those kinds of things. But that's kind of what's going on. So you're getting, you're using way less energy to get the same force. Okay? And the other part of this, as you will know, is that even though it's independent of velocity, you're actually getting more force eccentrically than you can if you maintain the concentric contraction. Okay? More force, less energy cost. It's like driving a Tesla. Okay. I get here and I go faster and I don't use any energy. I don't use any gas. In the same All right. So that's kind of what we're looking at with this sort of force velocity. Right? And the reason that this happens, again, all goes back to cross bridge mechanics. To do an eccentric contraction, I turn the muscle on so I recruit, cross bridges engage, and then they generate just slightly less force than whatever it is that I'm trying to lower down. And we just let gravity take over and the cross bridges just go for a ride. They engage, they get force, they don't have to break, they don't have to cycle. And they go down, and they stop, right? And then we do it over. So you're getting force, not having to cycle because they're not cycling, right? They don't ever have to be broken. So you're always gonna get whatever force you're supposed to out of those cross. But then we also get a little bit of extra force from the elasticity in connective tissue and in ligaments and tendons. Okay. Stretch a rubber band, what happens? It wants to snap back, but it's going to resist you, right? As you try to pull it, it's going to resist against you. Okay. And so as you lower that weight down, the connective tissue collagen in there is like a rubber band. It's resisting against being deformed and stretched. And so there's a little bit of extra force that comes from all of that, that you don't have to apply from your muscles. It's going to help counteract against gravity as you do all of these things. Okay. Similarly, when I get way down here to the bottom, I've stretched all that stuff out. I now have a bunch of stored elastic energy or potential energy that if I want to then come back up, 
I can get force from my muscle plus the force of returning all of that uh, connective tissue back to its original state, which is why if we ask anybody to stand up and jump and touch the ceiling, anybody want to do that? Not Brady, he's too tall and we're not back. Ethan, you want to do it? Yeah, just jump up there and touch the ceiling. Okay. What did he do before he jumped? Squat. We call that a stretch shortening cycle. We do an eccentric contraction, stretch, store potential energy in the connective tissue in those muscles that are getting stretched and in the tendons and ligaments. And then when you do a concentric contraction, you can release some of that stored energy to help propel you in the opposite direction, which is why. Wow. You always, if I'm like, do a jump without having to bend your knees, and you're like, what the fuck? How do I do that? That's a problem, right? So there we have it. This is why. This is the one my undergrads mind. I'm sure it won't be that. Wait, no. This is part of the critical thinking thing. We're not ready yet. I'm just going to say, you all can agree, you will stipulate that running downhill feels easier than running uphill. You had to pick the two things to do. You want to run downhill, right? Okay. Why is it easier? Does it cost you less energy? Like it, 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 it is, you're not imagining it. It's real, okay? And so we have done, we've done a couple of studies where we had people run. We put, we jacked the back end of the treadmill up and we'll kind of run downhill in the treadmill. You measure their VO2 and you're like, dude, are you even like doing anything? But you're going fast and just like nothing because it's all this breaking stuff. It's all, when I say breaking, I mean like breaking a car. Like you're not breaking. The eccentric contractions will break your sharpening. It's just, it's this breaking mechanism and it just doesn't cost very much energy. Okay. If you want, I thought this was fun. This is from the same group, John Frieden and Rick Lieber at San Diego. Frieden is the surgeon, Lieber's the doc and the researcher on these things, but they just try to create curves where they overlay force and velocity on, on top of sarcomere length um, in their kind of things. And so you can create these three-dimensional graphs on, okay, well, where am I? What's my velocity here on this, you know, on this axis? And what's my relative sarcomere length if I wanted to do something on this axis? You could do velocity and moment arm length, right? And you can create these curves they're going to kind of show us roughly where kind of where we are, how we end up in force at any given sort of joint angle and velocity. So I'm not going to ask you guys to do all of this. I just think it's kind of a fun mathematical exercise to try to get this data. Okay. We don't talk about this very much in class, but it's really important. Okay. For people that are interested in sports. Muscular power is in some ways the application of force production at a certain velocity. Okay? And so what we're going to see in the, in the dark line here, this is, we've got force on this axis, velocity on this axis. This is concentric force velocity. Curve. But if you take the force and you multiply it by the velocity, which gives us power, right? Load or force multiplied by, by velocity, we get this kind of inverse curve, right? And this inverse curve is the power curve. And what that can tell us then is if I want to generate maximal power, right, which is this application of these things, which may lead me to be able to accelerate, be able to move my mass at a certain particular speed, or if I am moving my mass, can I knock over somebody else that has a similar mass and, and those kinds of things? Then you can figure out roughly at what kind of velocity or what kind of force production level or percentage of your max are we going to get max power. Typically, max power occurs at about two thirds of peak work. Move two thirds of peak force production, and then about which corresponds to about one third of peak velocity. We can shift this curve with training, especially if you try to train fast. Um, to try to generate as much force as you can as fast as you can. You can shift this curve 
in theory, that's better for people that want to learn and sprint and jump and do those things. Um, if you want to know more about all of these kinds of things, um, next fall, Dr. Campbell will teach, um, will teach a class called Athlete Tracking, um, where they use the, I, call them, I want to call them the Caterpillar, but not like the Caterpillar, it's Caterpillar. But it's, a, it's an accelerometer that measures heart rate and some other things, where we'll, there's a little sports bra which you put it in, and it, it tracks, and you can go outside, it has a, um, a GPS in it. And then they do stuff with the force plate and everything so you can learn a lot of the things that people are doing. Um, like our basketball team does some of this stuff, I think football does. Every professional like soccer team in the world, they use the tracking software. Most people have these force plates that come in. Like in the new, you guys have seen the new the basketball workout center, right? The Griffin family, something, something, right? Family's doing a lot of work in that, it's really white. Made all the money and it's just bought the thing. But they have, like in their practice facility, like on the, they have the practice floor, you step off of the floor and there are force plates in, like built into the floor. And you like run, you've been practicing, you come over, you jump, you measure a bunch of things, and you go back and you practice. And at the end of practice, you come back over and you jump again. They use vertical jump high and the rate of force development and some of those things. They track those things and it can tell people stuff about. How well rested are people or fatigue pinched against or something like that. practice how practice was intense have you lost force production or not over the course of time and those kinds of things in addition to them they wear the catapult stuff and they can see like literally how many stops and starts did you have how many changes of direction did you have during practice during a game i still don't think they're um, they the same as like the gps for like soccer players and rugby players it's exactly the same thing yeah okay Exactly the same thing. And it measures heart rate while we're doing it. So power becomes an important this application of power can become an important thing for determining sports performance. If you're interested in this, then I would encourage you to think about taking Dr. Campbell's athlete tracking class next fall. Because this is really all that we're we'll talk a little bit about it in response to training, how we can move these things around if we don't spend money and much time. I'm much more concerned in this class about you guys understanding how we actually get force and the mechanisms and the things that control force and then that sort of what we're doing with this parameter once, once we've got it. Okay. Fiber power differs by fiber type, unsurprisingly, probably the same for fibers don't generate really as much power because they can't contract as fast. Is this the last one? Okay. So Unilateral versus bilateral movements. This is really interesting to me. Um, the neurology side of this is really, really fascinating. And so imagine that you're doing, as Christina did, a single arm curl versus doing a two arm, like curls with barbell with two arms. Okay. You do a single arm curl, figure out what the most weight you can lift with each arm is and you add them together. And then you compare that to the most weight you can lift when you're doing both of them simultaneously. And what you find out is that when you do an exercise and you use both limbs simultaneously, this is really about bilateral here, that you tend to get a little bit less force production than if you sum up the unilateral, sort of the force you get from that unilateral contraction. When you add your slides together. That's what that suggests, and it's even more pronounced right about here at um, a little bit higher velocities. What that is suggestive of is that there's some level of inhibition from contracting both sides at the same time. Okay. Some level of inhibition, because we know, right, we know that there's more potential in there. We're just not able to actually get to it. And so there's a little bit of evidence that it, it reduces motor unit recruitment. When you're doing things like this is because it's a more complex task to do both at the same time, then um, we begin to lose a little bit from, from doing all those kinds of things. So there's some really fascinating stuff that happens in the midst of all of this. Once we get to talking about resistance training, we'll talk about if you, you train one side, the other side gets stronger because the you know, there are these shared neural pathways that cross over in the brain. Um, and things that are going to do all of that. And so there's some really, really cool things that, that go on there. Kind of, kind of okay. Does that train individuals to be closer to the sun? 
It depends upon how they train. People that train bilaterally can make that ratio smaller. They can move a little closer. People that train unilaterally actually make it worse, make it bigger. It all comes down to how you train. So because the nervous system gets better at doing whatever it is you're asking it to do, it's not just you. Unilateral, is it unilateral? Yes. It goes up, but it goes up to a smaller extent. That's right. So is that basically saying like, um, I guess lower body like lunges are worse than say, like knee flexion or knee extension? Or, um, I didn't say that. Well, is that basically like how it's saying like, would lunges be considered bilateral, but it could be considered unilateral? Because technically you're working both legs. Just Are you different. working both legs when you do the lunge? Essentially. When you do your legs extended with the. Yeah. You can do them either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say, I would argue that it's not you know, a lot, depending upon how you're, how you're doing your lunge. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. There are many different ways to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
actually the dumbest one in our mind. I'm just going to keep up the world of the So I can be careful about this. I, 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 not, I haven't looked in, in a minute at what is the any newer research. Um, so if you're doing both things at a similar percentage, like you're kind of in a similar kind of percentage of mass range, you're going to be a similar over here. The hypertrophic response is, is probably going to be pretty similar. A lot of the difference is mostly driven by the nervous system strategy that's going on that's going to be there. Um, but it, it makes sense to me that if you told me that you get a little bit more out of doing the unilateral, then I would I, I wouldn't have a hard time with it. Just the last time that I had looked at this thing, the data from doing like two arm or two leg exercise, like you do squats or something, and you get roughly similar increases to what people do in stationary experience. So it's a, it, it, there's a little bit of apples and oranges that are going to be there, but it's, it's we're really kind of getting in the of that. Most of the stuff is the difference in the force production, mm -hmm. which if you work hard enough, you're going to get a big enough signal to get a similar amount of energy. And this is for concentric action. There's a certain I don't know. Okay. You may have just found your first study, Christina. Okay. We may have found a thesis project for Richard or for Elise. I honestly don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. The train responses are a little bit, neural train responses are a little bit different mm -hmm. for eccentric only action and concentric only action. But I'm not sure that I've ever seen this done for eccentric responses. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody try to. Two leg eccentric versus one leg. Partly because I don't know how they did this, how they were controlling the velocity. I don't know. We can have to see if the Kimcom has a thing that we an attachment we can put on where you can do both. I think it has where you can do knee extension, a, a double knee extension, but we'd have to check. Uh, spindles, uh, I hate spindles, bulgy tendons, okay. This is the fun part. We'll do a whole class on this. Okay. We'll do the spindle stuff and everything. We will do that on, on Monday. Let's do a little bit of the critical thinking now. And we'll do a little bit. We probably won't have enough time to get through all the critical thinking now. And then we'll do a little bit more of that on Monday. And then move on into everybody's least favorite thing, which is the pilots. So, all right. What? But I, I, I'm, of course, I'm being sarcastic about metabolism. Nobody likes metabolism. It's been my general experience that people are like, oh, I hate metabolism. I kind of like it, but you know, it's just a bunch of zooming process. So, okay. Maybe I do a bad job of teaching. Not nobody likes it. Uh, don't do it as difficult as Dr. Nolan does. I'm not sure why y'all are doing the metabolism of cardiovascular class. We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna leave it at that. Math model. I feel like you can talk about it too if you want to see. Okay. All right. What is the first critical thinking question? Dealing with the nation of angles and why it's an advantage. The nation of angles and why it's an advantage. Okay. Um, we'll go around. At least you didn't talk much last time. Why did you? Why do you think there is some sort of an advantage to pinnation? So, well, it decreases the amount of force that like when you muscle to tend it, it allows for more muscle fiber to be packed and shrinking in that space. So, you can increase more force just because there's more muscle fiber. I also said, like, the very angles at which muscle pulls everything can allow for greater specificity and like the 
Okay. Anybody have any clean suggestion add on to what Bruce said in a nice level of size Okay, everybody the same? No. Okay. That's true. But I feel like with the patient angles, um, you can have a smaller tendon get more room. So okay. Yeah. Okay. I also would like the distribution of the muscle across the tendon uh, creates less transfer of force to the tendon, which creates less transfer of force to the bone. Okay. But you have greater force being produced in order to make that movement. We're very inefficient as humans. I get my levers confused. We have a lot of second, second We have a lot of issues where the insertions are on the wrong side, right? They're on the wrong side of the axis of rotation. So, like at your knee, right? We don't have it. We actually are at a disadvantage. Like we're, we're losing because it's on this side. We have to generate more force than we would if it was on the other side. So, most of whatever class of leather they're actually very inefficient at transfer of force. I don't really like this. Between that and the pination, the pination ends up being better. We actually get more from it. We get more force, which is good. But it seems like a funky way of going. Okay. What's question number two? Downhill versus uphill and level. Mm -hmm. What about downhill versus uphill versus level? What's a, like going against gravity versus going with gravity? Yeah. Is that the question? I mean, it's just asking why is running downhill easier than running uphill yeah. or and why is it easier? Yeah, cost less energy. It cost less energy. We haven't talked about perception. We don't really talk about perception. You perceive it as being less because it uses less energy, you accumulate less sort of apparent signaling. So you're like, oh, this is less unpleasant. And it is because it's just costing you less energy. It's just easy. You know, because when you're running uphill, your stride length is decreased. So you have to like, you know, take more steps to go to the same amount Yeah. When you go faster, it costs you, you have to have faster turnover. That actually costs you more energy and it reduces your ability to generate force. So, yes. You can do this when we do cycling exercise, which you definitely do this in like the devs exercise fits lab class, which you probably don't do with back steps on the bike. But there's there's really interesting data on both running and cycling. We call it economy. It's the energy cost for whatever the work is. Um, some people want to call it efficiency, but we can't call it efficiency because we're not directly measuring the ADP turnover of the muscle. People will get really mad at you if you say that, um, even though we all know what we're talking about. We all know what somebody's trying to talk about. But if you increase, so at a, at a given pedaling frequency, we can set the bike up to where your work output is identical, right? So the, the, work, the force required goes down as your pedaling frequency goes up. So your work output's the same, but the VO2 cost shifts based upon like what your pedal frequency is. When you get to this high pedal frequency and it begins to become less economical. It actually costs you more to compete to the same work rate than it does in slower range. And that would be a reason you guys would do the O2 max test on the bike and you would be asked to, to pedal at a certain pedal rate while you're doing these things. And that pedal rate has been chosen because it falls in a range that is sort of better down. Efficient. Like a being 60 revolutions per minute. Exactly. Usually, in most people, you've got to get over like 90 or 95 revs per minute before you begin to become a little less economical. And that again depends upon what states of training, like the Larson's can probably pedal at that frequency and still destroy all of us. So, is that why most like wing gate tests are like they tell? Like when you start the test within 30 seconds, 
weight drops? Is that the reason why they tell you to pedal as fast as you can? That's partially because you've got to have some stuff going. Yeah. You need the uh, you need the momentum. Mm -hmm. So for my folks that don't have a strict kind of exercise space right now, a wind gate test. Anybody done one? Has anybody done it? Have you done you guys have done a wind gate test? They won't let us. We're not supposed to do wind gate tests with any gas here. They're considered to be sort of too scientists and too dangerous. We won't, we won't. You can't do them in the labs with the other guys. You can do it in the, if you want to do one game, we just ride the RV. We'll do it. In, we'll do one game. I would, no. No. Okay, so for the uninitiated, for the uninitiated, a wind gate test is a test on the bike where you pedal as hard and as fast as you can for 30 seconds. It is an all out sprint for 30 seconds on the bike. They give you a power output that's usually like 70% of your body weight. And you start, you pedal really fast and you get going where there's no resistance on the bike and you pedal as fast as you can. And then as Christina says, you drop the, the resistance at the start of the test and your resistance goes from like zero to whatever this big number is. Like 5% of your body weight. Yeah, something like that. And you're just like, oh, and you're trying to go and we'll do this. I'll show you guys this when we start talking about metabolism. But it's a measure of anaerobic metabolic sort of capacity and power. And what you watch is you just watch the pedal rate and it goes, and then it goes down and it plateaus off and it tracks exactly with the depletion of ATP stores, the depletion of creatine phosphate and those kinds of things. You get like 12 seconds in if you're just dead. And they're like, no, you're only halfway done. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, it's awful. We would do it. We would do it in the lab when I was a graduate student in the exercise space class. The, the lab that was associated with that, and literally every time, every time we do it every semester, people threw up. Like you just puked. They made him stop doing it, Georgia, because the kid fainted and hit his head on the water fountain and like cracked it open. Stop. I didn't Pardon? <laughs> I had a kid uh, last, not a kid, a student last fall. Um, I know it's bad. Um, she says of the student who was like two years younger than her. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> but uh, he got super dizzy and then proceeded, we laid him down in recovery position, proceeded to puke all over our floor. Yeah. Our lap. It's awful. <laughs> like you're not right for days. It's worse for, he did what? I did that at Coastal for his study. Mm -hmm. That hurt. So there's a there's also a guy, a very, very famous exercise physiologist. His name is Martin Shabala, and he is at I think it's McMaster. Um let's get my we need Kellogg. He knows where all the good Canadian universities are. Uh, but his his sort of shtick, and he's written a book, and it's like the you know, like the one minute workout. And what they started off with all of this doing was they had people do five Wingate tests. You would do a Wingate test, you'd rest for two minutes, you'd do a Wingate test. And so it was like the 12 minute workout. And so it's high intensity interval training. What they found from all of this was that it really, really works um, and really drives these big increases in VO2 max and capillary density and a lot of things that you would get from like a normal, I'm gonna go run for a half an hour at like a kind of a bliss jog or something. And they've now like worked it down where if you'll do, it's basically if you'll do three 20 second fall out sprints, that you get like 90% of what you get from doing the five wind gates. Because what they figured out is that they're like, bro, you got to come do five wind gates. And they're like, nope, nope, not doing that. Grandma's not doing five wind gate tests today. That's her training stimulus. But that was the suggestion was like, this is good because we don't, none of us have any time. Go get on your Peloton bike and do your five Wingate tests, and you're done in 10 minutes, which I assure you when you have a two-year-old that you're like, I have 10 minutes, oh my God, right? That's the longest time in the world. And then in your 10 minutes, you're like, I gotta go to the bathroom, and I gotta clean up, and I gotta do this. Um, and so they've run it down so it's like three 20-second ones. So they have to deal with, they have a study where they had freshmen in dorms and McMaster's sprinting up the stairs in their freshman dorm for 20 seconds at a time. And it works. They have the same sort of kind of mentally the same kind of thing. So 
So you will see the windows there we go. It's awful. It's awful. Because by number five, you're just like, Four seconds for us. Another very famous exercise in the school district. Four seconds. Okay, Matt, sorry. Is there recovery costs assigned? For each one of those? Yeah. I assure you by the last one, you're you're probably not like you're not you're not fully yeah, yeah. we need to keep the next day in that like minute. Oh, I see what you're saying. I don't know. Another good question. Well, take notes. Write all these down. Would be so the, the day after. When's your what's the recovery like? What do you look like the day after doing one of those things compared to if you had done sort of the regular thirty minutes and sixty percent of your time? This is good. We're getting thesis projects for everybody, right? Everybody, everybody, pay attention. These are good ideas. Yes. Yes. You never know when you Pardon? Risk 60 to 70 percent of your device, so like a normal submission of part training. Yeah, depending. I'm not. I gotta think for y'all. Might wait for me. No, but yeah, somewhere in that in that in that range. Pardon? No, for me it's lower. <laughs> fucking old. So my y'all got like twenty beats a minute of max heart rate on you. So <laughs> plus I'm a weirdo. It's art. It's really high, like all the time. It's like like I'll be doing like fifty percent of you to max, and my heart rate will be at like eighty percent or something of you know, like heart rate reserve, and then it stays there, and then I kind of climb up, and then it goes on up. I'm I'm a weirdo. So I don't really count. Yes. Okay. Was there another question about downhill running? Is there another question on the critical thinking about them? Just the last one is just why eccentric uh, create greater force. I gave you all the answers during the lecture. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, and then yeah, we skipped three. What was three? Three was the um, how muscle fibers could be classified and size using their contractile properties. Okay. Can I do that? Can I do that? Is that the question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Sure. <laughs> what do you got back there, bud? I uh, put rice up, so measuring the mm -hmm. 40 percent. Okay. And then every time you touch those fast rice signs, put it in the Okay, good, good. Excellent, excellent. That's one way to do it. What else could we use other than rise time? Okay, time to keep tension. Good. It would look basically the same, right? Those are those are really kind of two ways of measuring the front side of things. And then half relaxation for calcium uptake. Right. Okay. okay. Could do that. So, maybe you want to try to explain? Uh, yes. If you, if you just measure like the max. Then you find out the two guys would be in return as long as you can't really tell them once it's not So, what I showed you guys data wise, and the way the question was originally written, is for doing like one action, this twitch characteristic, right? The electrically stimulated twitch characteristics. You could also have a person perform contractions by just like do them voluntarily. And so it's, we can look at the shape of the force velocity curve, 
and you will, that's going to change based upon fiber type. You can look at the shape of the power curve. That's going to change based upon fiber type. You can even calculate the same thing. You can calculate time to peak tension and rise time. Just tell the person to try to contract their muscle as forcefully as fast as they possibly can. And you should generally people that are fast twitchers are going to be able to have they're going to be a little bit quicker going up. Um, I'll show you guys some data. We get resistance training. People like looking like the first 200 milliseconds of like the onset of force, and they look at different effects of things that are going there. Um, you can measure the electrical signals getting to the muscle with something called EMG. We look at the corresponding EMG signal in those kinds of things and look at how those things change. So there's some, you can really try to parse things down. Um, and then again, if you take exercise this lab with Dr. Deb, I think y'all will do y'all will do a different test on the on the pin pound on the isokinetic atomometer, where you do a certain number of contractions as fast as you can in a certain amount of force to measure you measure like how much you fatigue and something, and that correlates allegedly with your fiber pound. It's a Scandinavian pattern. But if you, you never get away with it today, because it's based on like a study that has like 10 subjects in it. They ran a they ran a regression equation, right? Stats don't we don't have stats. Don't talk about regression like prayer yet. Right. Not yet. Okay. When you do, you should ask him what he thinks. I'll, we'll find that paper. And y'all should ask him what he thinks about that. But you're supposed to have like 30 participants per variable in your regression equation at least. And this whole study has like 10, so you can never get away with that now. It works in the center. and it works. I mean, like the thing looks probably pretty reasonable, but. You can never get away with that. The world is wider. You know that you can do whatever you want. Okay. Trying to decide if I should ask y'all other questions. We'll try this. We'll see how it goes. Okay, you are running a race against your clone. Okay, you've mastered cloning technology, and we have a clone of you. Okay, we grew your clone when we pulled some cells out. We grew your clone in like five minutes, and they're sitting there right next to you. Okay, they're exactly identical to you physiologically. Then we've got them right now. They're exactly as trained as you are. Whatever you are. That's exactly what they are right now. You have to run a race against your clone. Okay? How do you beat your clone in a race? No, you can't beat them up. Run behind them? Yeah. You're sure to lose them. How are you going to get ahead of them? Yeah. Right at the end? Right at the end? The win. But the assumption is that, right, that they, if you're going to try to go and sprint, that they're going to all, they can sprint just as fast as you. But they're going to be blocking the wind from you for the whole marathon. And then at the end, they're going to, they had to waste energy to cut the wind, whereas you're right behind them and can just zoom around them and block them. <laughs> Okay. Not hard. <laughs> a reasonable. Too many people have been watching too much Formula One <laughs> on, on Netflix. We're talking about drafting strategy. Okay. Okay. That's reasonable. What if I told you that whenever you speed up, your clone speeds up? Is it shorter or longer? Long. Takes me to get Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. What if we did it this way? You're running against your clone. We have not discussed what this is yet. Um, but there's a parameter called critical velocity. And your clone is going to run at, your, at its critical velocity, which means that basically that's the fastest pace at which it can run without getting like fatigue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's going to run at that pace the entire race, never going up, never going down, that pace the whole race. Okay. If you run faster than that, Okay, you're going to get tired. Okay? And so 
The assumption, let's not take our thing. Well, they're going to run at that speed. And we're just going to do this at the very, very end. Just throw that part out. What else could you do based upon things that we've learned today or something in class? Well, they're going to be running at the same speed the whole time, like the same velocity and everything. Hmm? Then you can increase your velocity going downhill if there are hills, which then would put you further in front of them. Okay. And because they're having to stay at the same speed, they have to stay at the same speed going up and down. Okay. And if you go faster going down, you're saving energy. Okay. Yeah. Your critical velocity going downhill is another possible piece of equation. Should be faster. Wait, what was it? Critical velocity going downhill? Should be faster than someone's critical velocity going on the level or the left. That's good because it's related to metabolic cost. Okay, Matt? Okay, that's okay. Ethan? They are very. So, so, what happens is you run at this pace and then you go over for a little bit and then you duck back under and you rest and you go over. And then you get to the very, very end and then they just, they just. All out, try to sprint to get over. So there's a lot of strategy in distance racing. A lot of times, like you know, people will go out super duper slow, and then they just wait, and then you know you've got to try to kick the last lap or something. And then it just becomes a slightly pre-fatigued 400 meters or something in in the midst of all of that. Where, whereas you know if you do cycling like 300 mile races or marathon or these things, there's it, there's a, there's so much more distance that there's less chance that if somebody wants to go out really slow, you just like screw you and go kind of a thing. So, but yes, we could, so that would be a way to sprint on the downhill. So, so that's like interesting to the other end cross country. Uh -huh. and like you were taught to like charge uphill and then yeah. just like ride the downhill. Mm -hmm. You should probably do the opposite. I would imagine it would be so the, the guy that was my master's thesis advisor, Kevin McCulloch, Kevin was a cross country runner in high school. He might have been on the team in Western Michigan, maybe he's an undergrad, but that was his strategy. And he didn't know anything about it, but he just sort of did this. And he, he probably did it. His dad was a math professor, probably had some math, but sprint on the downhills because you're not going to get nearly as, you know, the, the energy cost is way less. Other people tend to want to slow down and rest on the downhill, sprint the downhill, and then you know, and then slow it back down when you get to level or going up and you sort of caught up. You're, you're making the best use of people resting when they shouldn't be resting. So. Yeah, you know, and like the cross country nationals at high school. Mm -hmm. And if there's like a huge downhill in the last 800 meters of the race, and I've watched it for like the last 10 years and like five out of those years when there's been just whoever's gone fastest on the downhill. Just freaking kill it, man. So we'll talk more about some of those things when we get through this class and talk about especially aerobic performance. Resistance training performance, like you want to be a power lifter, just be big. Like I'm serious, like just be big, have a lot of muscle, practice whatever that thing is when you get to know it. There's way more integrative stuff to this than serious. Okay. Good deal, everyone. Please make sure that I get your critical thinking questions. One of these days, I will actually put your quizzes into Canvas, and then I will remember to bring them to class and give them back to you.